time zone and good evening. Um, good evening uh, to those uh, from the Asian time zone. My name is uh, Donna Wong, um, Associate Professor from the uh, Sport Sciences Faculty. So um, today, um, yes, before we start, uh, basically uh, there are some uh, housekeeping to do. So um, the first important thing is that uh, please uh, kindly, I think, uh, mute your uh, mic. Uh, you'll be able to uh, turn it back on um, during the Q&A session so that uh, we, we don't accidentally, I think, uh, basically, I think, know about your deeper stalker secret. So yes, first thing to do, uh, please uh, mute your mic. So uh, the second thing is that uh, you will probably have seen the message, I think, appearing. So um, these, basically, this session will be recorded. So for those uh, who are not able basically to stay for the whole session, you'll be able to access uh, this recorded um, lecture on YouTube. The web link will be posted on our um, sports science uh, faculty website. Uh, we'll also be forwarding, I think, the web link when it's ready uh, to Simon. So Simon can post it in his Twitter as well. So if you can't uh, find it, just go to Simon's uh, Twitter to, to find the web link. So see, Simon, I'm directing traffic to your Twitter. <laughs> so um, yes, the third thing is, uh, this is how we're going to do it today. Uh, Simon will probably talk about an hour or so, and we'll leave uh, 20 to 30 minutes of uh, Q&A. So um, without further ado, um, yes, I'm going to ask Simon um, uh, to start with his uh, lecture for today. So, um, Professor Simon Chadwick, Professor uh, of Eurasian Sports Industry from M. Leo Business School in France. He's also the director of the Center for Eurasian Sports. So, uh, I'll let him introduce, I think, what he's going to talk about today. Take it away, please, Simon. Thank you, Donna. E.M. Lyon, Donna, or if you're in France, O.M. Lyon. Uh, so, you should have asked me about that before we started. Next time, we'll practice it better. So uh, good, good, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and, and whatever else, wherever else you are. Um, thanks, Donna, for the introduction. Thank you, Jun, and your team for arranging this. And thank you to Waseda for, uh, for inviting me to, to give this public lecture. The reason for giving this public, public lecture is uh, for the last two or three months, I've been working as a, a virtual uh, visiting professor with Waseda. Um, for those of you who don't know, Waseda is in, in Tokyo, in Japan. Uh, great place to visit, fantastic university, um, but I'll leave them to do their marketing afterwards. Uh, that's if I finish before uh, midnight. Um, anyway, thanks to everybody who's, uh, who's here. Uh, as Donna said, my name is Simon Chadwick. Um, what I'd like to, to do is to, to, to share my screen to begin with, because I think rather than me just talk aimlessly, it's probably better if I, if I share my presentation with you. Um, what I'm going to do today is, is, it might sound like kind of a, an amazingly academic title using words like utilitarianism and, and neoclassicism. Um, I'm actually going to use lots of photographs today. Uh, I'm not going to use too many long words, hopefully. Um, I anticipate, or at least I hope, that it will be relatively accessible. But the reason that I wanted to, to give this presentation today is, is really two things or two reasons. The first one is, is the title of the presentation is drawn from the title of a, a, a journal article that I just had published in the European Sport Marketing Quarterly. I'm going to give you the, uh, the, the web URL in just a moment, um, which you, you can take a look at. And the article was published in this particular uh, uh, journal issue um, thanks to somebody called Christos, Dr. Christos. Uh, he's in the room today. You know, I, I bow my head in true Japanese fashion and say thank you, Christos, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to, to publish. Um, hopefully we'll drive a little more traffic towards your journal special, special edition, but we'll get to that in a moment. So that's the first reason. The second reason is we kind of live in a crazy world. And, and rather than getting easier and simpler, it, it seems to be getting more complicated. And, and so one of the things that, that I've 
I've tried to do, not just with this journal paper, but I also try and do with this presentation today, is to somehow make some sense of what's happening. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not about to try and explain the world. You know, I'm not, I'm not the leader of the free world or you know, a president of the globe. You know, all I'm trying to do is to try and understand sport. Um, so what I'm going to give you today is, 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 is my insight into what I think is happening in the world, what has happened in the world over the last uh, uh, kind of 100 years or so, and then to think in terms of what this means for sport. So I'm here as a sport academic. I'm not here as a geopolitician. You know, I'm not an international diplomat. I'm not a spy. Um, what I am is somebody who's trying to explain sport. OK, so. Really, why I'm here today and what I should be here to talk about is to talk about kicking a ball. That's that's why I'm really here is is I'm, you know, and, and, and yes, for those of you who haven't spotted, this is me. My mother always made made me uh, made me put my shirt in my trousers. She, I, you know, I always had to tuck my shirt in my trousers. Um, or in this particular case, my shorts. But yes, this is me. And, and I started off my life kicking a ball because I used to like kicking a ball, meeting my friends after school, you know, kicking a ball for three or four hours. And, and that's how I started out. And, and I'd love to be here today to be, to be able to talk about the joys and the excitement of kicking a ball and to talk about the friends I made and the skills that I learned and what kicking a ball has done for me in terms of my life. But unfortunately I can't because today what I'm here to do is to talk about this. Now, I mentioned a little earlier about the URL. What I will try to do, once I finish my presentation, what I will try to do is to, um, cut and paste the URL into the chat forum. But just to say to you, this is a very, this, this journal paper is a bit available, uh, full text, free until the end of March. Um, so you will be able to, to, to read this if you want to read this after today's presentation. But essentially this is, this is, this is the journal paper on which this presentation is, uh, is, is based. Um, Donna gave a little bit of an introduction. I'm not gonna talk uh, too long about who I am and what I do, um, but I'm based in Paris. Uh, my school also has a campus in Shanghai. And so I have this particular interest in uh, what, everything that happens between, if you draw a red line from London to Tokyo, I'm interested in everything along that red line from London to Tokyo. So certainly what's been happening in recent weeks is of particular interest to me because it's it's what interests me and it's what I research and write about. It's also what I teach too. Um, but if you want to know more, uh, by all means, get in touch. Otherwise, I'm going to give an, another reading at the end that's a little bit shorter and sharper and easy to access, more succinct. Um, but if you want to know more, <clears throat> by all means, follow on Twitter. I don't tweet about my lunch. Uh, I don't tweet about where I go on holiday. I tweet about sports stuff um, and hopefully reasonably informed and, and, and intelligent and thought provoking sports stuff. Otherwise, you're welcome to email me. So if there are questions after today's um, um, presentation, <clears throat> you want more readings, you want to know more, you want to ask a question, you want to come to Paris and, and drink coffee in the sun, then obviously you can uh, you can email me afterwards. OK, so that's the preamble. First thing to say is, and I'm sure most of you will have spotted this already, not least because I, I said it like two minutes ago, we live in a complex and turbulent world. And this seem, the, the world seems to be getting more complex, and more turbulent. And I guess the most obvious complicatedness about the world and, and, and the most obvious turbulence for me as a European, for me as a European working in Europe is what has been happening in Ukraine. And what we've seen happening in Ukraine is obviously is, is, is a tragedy. Some people are calling this uh, a case of, of, of war crime. Um, there are lots and lots of ways we could, we could talk about it, lots of ways we could analyze and label it. But as I say, I'm here today to think in terms of sport. 
And I show you this particular image because this is the, the Gazprom Arena in St. Petersburg in Russia. The Gazprom Arena in St. Petersburg in Russia is the home of Zenit St. Petersburg. Um, some of you may know this football team, very strong Russian club, uh, sometimes plays in the UEFA Champions League. Uh, Zenit St. Petersburg is owned by Gazprom. Uh, it's also sponsored by Gazprom. It plays in a, in a, in a, um, a Gazprom stadium, or, or at least a, a stadium that has ga a Gazprom naming rights association. Uh, some of you may also know Gazprom is a UEFA sponsor, sponsors the Champions League. What you may not know is that Gazprom is really central to what has been happening in Ukraine over the last three weeks, actually more like over the last two decades. And so the political, political and military situation that we now see in Ukraine, Gazprom is center stage in all of that. And yet here we are, an event host, uh, a football club owner, a UEFA sponsor. And, and so you have Russia and sport and sponsorship and football and politics and gas uh, crucially, Gazprom is a state-owned oil and gas, sorry, state-owned gas corporation. So Gazprom is owned by the Russian state. As many of you will know in the room that, that UEFA has now terminated its sponsorship deal with Gazprom and has moved the Champions League final away from, um, uh, from um, um, St. Petersburg to Paris. And for me, this, this particular example embodies what I'm going to talk about today. So it's not just about sport, it's also about politics, it's also about energy supplies, it's about sponsorships, it's about the geographic interests of countries, it's about where sports events take place, it's about in, uh, industrial strength, it's also about political strength, political projection too. We'll come back to that. Now, we should have, you know, in some ways, we should have known, we should have known what was going to happen in this particular instance, in this particular episode. Because if you go back to last November, some of you may know this tennis player, Pong Shui. Um, up, up until, I guess, the end of October, most people in the world probably didn't know Pong Shui. Um, they, they, you know, they, some people may have known her. She's been relatively successful in doubles not especially successful uh, in, in singles tennis. But of course, what happened is, is she posted a message on social media um, late last year, which she took down. She took down within 30 minutes. But what followed that was a political storm, uh, a geopolitical storm, if we could call it that, uh, that. Now, again, I'm not here necessarily to analyze in detail this specific episode and, and what was involved and who was involved. Uh, but what we do know is, is that the WTA pulled out of China. So again, you had in China, a Chinese tennis player making allegations about a Chinese political figure, which ultimately resulted in a, in a, a sport organization based in the United States withdrawing from the Chinese market. Some of you will then recall that subsequent to this is, is the International Olympic Committee's Thomas Bach uh, participated in a video call with, with Pong Shui uh, that seemed very contrived and artificial because all, all that we saw were the photographs of this meeting. And, and what was really interesting about Thomas Bach is Thomas Bach had spent most of 2021 telling us all that the IOC is not a political political organization. And, and yet here he was, front and center stage, dealing with this Pong Shui episode. Now, clearly what Thomas Bach was worried about is that there might be a mass boycott of the 2022 Winter Olympic Games in, in Beijing. And so he was, you know, he was involved in, in damage limitation and, and trying to address some of the risks that the Pong Shui episode was posing for the IOC. But nevertheless, we, we, we saw all manner of, of, of different responses across the world. The response in China was different to the response that we saw in places like France or Britain or, or the United States. But again, 
you know, much like the Gazprom episode, the Pong Shui episode wasn't just a sporting issue. It was an economic issue, a commercial issue, a political issue, an issue of geography, uh, an issue of gender politics. So very complex, very turbulent. But of course, it's not the other. I'm going to I'm going to give this as the third and final example just for the moment. So I, I, I give this as a third example because technically, as someone who works in Paris, this is my local club. It's a bit of a rubbish local club because they got knocked out of the Champions League the other night. I used to work in Manchester. You know, at least Manchester has got still got a club in the Champions League. You know, Paris doesn't even have a club left in the Champions League now, so it's a bit of a rubbish club. Um, you know, but technically, this you know, this is my local club, and and this is a French club set up in, or established in, in 1971, rel relatively new in in European football terms, relatively new, but a French club with a very particular identity in Paris, in France, uh, historically owned by French people. But as some of you will know, back in 2011, Paris Saint-Germain was bought by, effectively bought by the Qatari government. And some of you will know since, since 2011, Paris Saint-Germain has, for instance, bought Neymar, bought Mbappe, I think Neymar and Mbappe together cost somewhere upwards of about 220, 230 million euros, which is unprecedented, incredible spending on football players. When, when Neymar was signed by Paris Saint-Germain, uh, Paris Saint-Germain not only broke the transfer record, they more than doubled the world transfer record. And this was based upon category government money. Now, significantly when Paris Saint-Germain bought Neymar in 2017, Qatar was just becoming embroiled in a really serious feud, a diplomatic feud with its near neighbours. So Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain and several others uh, curtailed, they, they ended their diplomatic relations with Qatar. So for me, the signing of Neymar for, as I say, a huge amount of money, to, to, uh, something like almost 200 million pounds um what uh, what is what essentially um uh was happening is is that qatar was signaling it was using the signing of neymar to signal to its near neighbors and political rivals so again in this particular episode you know a little bit of business a little bit of politics a little bit of sport diplomatic feuding regional politics and 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 we 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 could go on, I could go on, I could say more, but I'm not going to because what I want to do is, is, is to leave you with those three, three episodes and I'm going to talk about other episodes, I'm going to talk about other issues, but I'm going to leave you with Gazprom, the Champions League, UEFA, I'm going to leave you with Pong Shui and, and uh, the, the WTA, the Women's Tennis Association, and I'm gonna leave you with Paris Saint-Germain. So even if, you've, even if you pay no further attention to what I, what I say, you know, just keep those three examples in mind because they are evidence of this complicated, turbulent world in which we live. But what I wanna do is I wanna move on to providing some contextual detail about why we live in this complicated world, particularly in a, in a sporting context. Because as I say, I, I do have opinions. I do have personal opinions about Qatar. I've got personal opinions about Paris Saint-Germain. I've got personal opinions about Russia. I've got personal opinions about Putin, um, but I'm not here to express my personal opinions. What I'm here to do is, is to try and help people think a little more in a, in a little more detail and with a, a little more complexity about sport. So the context for, for what I'm gonna say a little later is, is to think in terms of three ages of modern sport. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not in the business of, I'm not gonna to talk today about who invented football or who invented ice hockey or who invented basketball. Um, I'm gonna talk specifically about modern sport. And the first, period or the first what I would call you know, a kind of era or period of modern sport that I'm going to talk about is is I guess is late mid to late 19th century 
European sport in particular. And this, what I've put up in front of you is a, is a painting. For those of you who, of course, you've spotted it's a painting. It's not a photograph. Of course, it's a painting. You know, this is a painting by an English artist called Lowry. For those of you who don't know Lowry, Lowry was uh, painted in, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries uh, from Manchester. So he was, uh, he was working in, in, he was painting, doing his work in Manchester at the time of the Industrial Revolution. So you know, I take you back to mid to late 19th century, Europe, Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was hard. It was incredibly uh, you know, labor intensive. People worked really, really hard, long hours. And so what we saw uh, mid to late 19th century is, is sports began to develop or as, a, as an outlet for people to you know, basically get away from work and get away from their really, really tough lives. You know, many people worked in factories. It was heavy manual labor. And, and so if we think about, um, for example, English football, the oldest, uh, the oldest professional football club in the world now is in Sheffield. And for those of you who don't know, Sheffield, Sheffield is a, a, a northern English city. Historically, Sheffield was known for its steel production. So really, really heavy labor, heavy manual labor producing steel. And what people did on a Saturday to get away from their work is they went to football. And so we, we, we saw English football, but not just English football. I think we also saw you know, German football and Spanish football as Europe industrialized in this way. Football became a popular outlet for people to, to enjoy their leisure time. And Larry, Larry captured this in, in, his, in, in, in his paintings. Now, for me, what was really significant about this is, is most English people seem to think that England invented football. England did not invent football. England did not invent football. But what did happen in England is English football codified the sport in a way that even now, essentially, the world plays football now according to a set of rules and a set of and a code that was developed by the English. Now, subsequent to this, as you will know, UEFA was established and, and later FIFA was established. And for those of you who know your football history for a long time, and, and in fact, even now, English football within FIFA and within UEFA has a kind of special role, a special status. But I would ask you to keep in mind that UEFA, so English, you know, whether you're playing football in Japan or you're playing football in South Africa or you're playing football in Argentina or playing football in Russia, you're playing football according to a set of rules and codes that were developed in 19th century England. You were a UEFA based in Europe. FIFA, set up by Europeans, still based in Europe. The IOC, set up by Europeans, still based in Europe. So if we take the IOC as a, an alternative example, the International Olympic Committee, this essentially is a European institution. Although there are members of the IOC, board members and decision makers who are not European, this is a European organization set up by Europeans and operated on the basis of rules that were effectively created by Europeans. Now to accentuate this point even further, if you go to Switzerland in the, in the area around Zurich, so some of you may know the Geneva to Zurich railway line. If you travel from, from Geneva to Zurich on the train, which is about 90 minutes, there are 45, 45, 45, 45 global sports governing bodies based in that part of Switzerland. Okay, listen to my word, global, global sports governing bodies. 
So the sport that people play in Japan, the sport that people play in Australia, the sport that people play in Mexico are governed by institutions in Europe that were very often founded by Europeans and certainly in their early years of, of, of formation were, were populated by Europeans. Now, this is important because these institutions are essentially or, or were essentially utilitarian in their origin. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with utilitarianism as a philosophy, uh, utilitarianism is essentially the pursuit of the greatest good for the greatest number. So in terms of how you organize and deliver sport, you know, the essence of utilitarianism is that sport should be for everyone. And, and some of you may ha have heard this term sport for all. And, and, and so sport in this, the, this sense is a public good. And, and there are some people in the room today who probably believe that actually sport should be free. So you should be able to go to a, a gym and it should be free. And, and some of you will live in countries where there are actually public gyms outside. So you don't, you don't have to pay to use these, you know, these, these running machines or pay to use these cycling machines. You've got them in public parks. Now, that's a very, very utilitarian view of the world, which is that you should provide sport as, as, you know, in terms of the greatest good for the, great, the greatest number. And in this sense, sport is a public good. So when, when, um, when the Olympics was established, when the World Cup was established, the Football World Cup was established, you know, when, when basketball tournaments, volleyball tournaments were established initially by Europeans, this kind of central principle of utilitarianism and, and sport as a public good, the greatest, the greatest good for the greatest number was, was dominant. So, so some of you in the room today, this is what you believe. This is what you still believe. And, and if you cut me open inside and kind of, you know, open me up, you know, there's, there's kind of a big part of me still, a big part of me still, you know, my football team, for example, you know, my, my, my fandom, my, my support for my football team, the town where I was born, the town where I went to school, the town where my family still lives, this is my club. And, and it was very much part of this 19, late 19th century into the early part of the 20th century utilitarian fandom. So this is, you know, this is about my club, my community, my town, greatest good for the greatest number. But as we progressed into the 20th century, the world began to change. And Europe, the, the dominance of Europe certainly in sporting terms, became challenged by uh, United States sport. And, and I think the crucial thing to keep in mind about US sport is, is that, in my view, it really wasn't until the mid 20th century that, that a, a, a more US focus or US based model of sport began to, began to, to, to impose itself. And an important or a significant detail in this is, is you should keep in mind that the NBA, the National Basketball Association, you know, the, the kind of Michael Jordan and Steph Curry and you know, New, uh, Chicago Bulls and Golden State Warriors, you know, this NBA wasn't created until 1951. So it was 1951 that the NBA, as we know it today, started. Now, my, fo my football club, Northern Town, Industrial Revolution, utilitarian, 1876. So my football club is nearly 100 years older than the NBA, nearly, nearly 100 years older than the NBA. The NBA didn't start until 1951. An important side detail, so just to, to kind, of, kind of digress related to this, also keep in mind that the United States is one of the few countries in the world, in, in, in fact, possibly the only country in the world, I've not done my homework, I should have done my homework, but it could possibly be the only country in the world that doesn't have a sports ministry. And... This is really significant because you know, even in Britain, 
where our government has a very laissez-faire approach to government policy. Now, even in Britain, we have a sports ministry. If you're in Japan, you have a sports ministry. If you're in China, you have a sports ministry. For those of you who are joining from, from Belgium, from Greece, you've got a sports ministry. The United States does not have a sports ministry because essentially US sport is driven by the marketplace. And significantly, for those of you who are economists or who have knowledge of, of economics, um, there is a, a school of economic thought called neoclassicism. So neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics is based upon classical economics and classical economics and neoclassical economics essentially is based upon um, markets and uh, essentially private entities making rational economic decisions. Now, if you think in terms of what's happened since 1951, what we've seen is, for instance, the development of sponsorships. So the history, there is a long history of sponsorship going back to Roman times when gladiators used to be sponsored, or certainly there would be philanthropic uh, arrangements between rich people and, and gladiators during Roman times. But sponsorship as we know it today really only has its origins in, in the mid 20th century. And, and, and it, it came out of um, this US model of sport where there was no state funding. So there was no state funding for the NBA. There was no state support for the NBA, no state support for the National Hockey League, for American football. If you're into NASCAR or IndyCar racing, no, no state support for this. Essentially, whatever money these sports had was, was derived from the marketplace, was derived from commercial sources. And so essentially what we saw from the mid-1950s mid through to the, the, the end of the 20th century, and even into the start of this century, the 21st century, certainly in the 2000s, what we saw is, is the development of uh, what I would call a neoclassical model of sport. So based on markets, based on money, and based on individual gain. And sport essentially has started to become a private good. And what we, what we mean by a private good is unless you pay, you don't get access to it. So, you know, some of you will know it's, it's going back to you know, in using the utilitarian example, for those of you who want to go to a, a, and, and use gym equipment, you go to your local public park and in your local public park, which is probably owned by the government, there will be some free gym equipment. And, and it's pretty basic gym equipment. There's probably not a lot of it, but at least it's there. It's a public good. If you want really, really great gym equipment, if you want to go to a fantastic gym with air conditioning, uh, you know, really nice restaurant that you can eat in afterwards. The equipment is state of the art and there's lots of it. Great, then pay. And that's a prime example of this kind of more neoclassical view of, uh, of, of sport, which is about markets, money, individual games, sport as private goods. If you think about a club like Manchester United, owned by American sports entrepreneurs, Many people refer to Manchester United as a, as a money-making machine. So Manchester United has ceased to be a utilitarian institution. Certainly in the minds of some people, it will still be a utilitarian institution. But in many ways, Manchester United, through its American owners, they are there, they are there to make money. They're not there to display their utilitarian credentials. They are there to make money. And if you think about how Manchester United makes money, one of the things that Manchester United does very, very well, it doesn't play football very, very well, but one of the things that it does very well is, is commercially, for example, creating this incredibly diverse um, portfolio of commercial partners. That is what Manchester United does well. And we see, for example, Kansai Paints, a Japanese paint company. You might ask, why does Manchester United need a paint supplier? 
or an official paint supplier, but it does. It has Kansai paints from Japan. And this is a prime example of, of ne a neoclassical model of sport, which is you know, selling rights, essentially making, making sport or making elements of sport private property and, and, and generating revenues from that. So for most of us in the room today, I guess, probably if you, if you were born, you know, if you were born sometime over the last 20, 30, 40 years, for many of us, you know, you'll, know, you, you, you'll know about this. It's about, it's about making money from sports. So whether we're talking about Manchester United or we're talking about Formula One or we're talking about the Olympic Games or you know, whoever we're talking about, it's been about making money. But I think 1992 was a, was a, a really important year. And, and I would highlight 1992 because I think what is happening today, literally today, what is happening today, I forget the date, what is it, 19th? 18th, 17th of March, whatever. I turned up on time. That's the most important thing. I can't remember the date, but you know, today, today, the origins of what is happening today, I think we can trace the, the roots or the DNA of that back to, back to 1992. In 1992, the English Premier League was launched. So this was the first season, 1992 into 1993 was the first English Premier League season. The English Premier League was created um, following a, a, a review undertaken by the English Football Association in 1990. And this resulted in a, in a publication called the uh, Blueprint for the Future of Football. So for those of you who are real, you know, you're into football history, you know, the, 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 the blueprint for the future of football published in 1990 by the English Football Association. And one of the conclusions, in fact, one of the one of the main and maybe even the main conclusion of the, the this blueprint for the future of football document is that a Premier League should be set up to make money. OK, a Premier League should be set up to make money. So in 1992, the English Premier League was launched to make money and the Premier League today does make money and the clubs within the Premier League do make money. That's what they do. Also in 1992, hence the, uh, um, the, the image at the side of the, uh, the slide, is the European Champions League. The UEFA Champions League was also launched. Now, previously, the European Champions League had been the European Cup, established in the 1960s, you know, it's still essentially a utilitarian institution. But in 1992, the European Cup became and absolutely became a neoclassical economic institution because the Champions League was set up to make money. So what you had in 1992 was the English Football Association and UEFA reaching the same conclusions that sport could and should be operated on a much more financial basis. Now go back to 1984, just a little bit beforehand and, and at the, the, the Los Angeles Olympic Games in 1984, a new commercial model was launched and, and that commercial model the IOC launched was very much around, let's make money. Let's make money from sport. But the other thing about 1992, Premier League, Champions League, is uh, a book called The End of History was published. And, and some of you may know the, this book called The End of History. And momentarily, I've forgotten the name of the author. What a terrible thing. It's there, Francis Fukuyama. So Francis Fukuyama, obviously an, Ameri an American academic of Japanese or origin, Francis Fukuyama published a book called The End of History. And, and basically his, his central thesis in this book is capitalism has won. So capitalism has won. So Fukuyama's view was that, that 
you know, communism had been defeated, that you know, even, even systems and societies where there was a more utilitarian view of the world, they had also been defeated and that the victor had been this neoclassical US focused capitalist money oriented private system of delivering products and, and of, of living our lives, it had won. So 1992 is, 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 is a really significant year because essentially we've gone from utilitarianism through to this kind of view of neoclassicism and Fukuyama, if Fukuyama was a, a sport fan, I, I've never met him, I've never asked him, but imagine he was a sport fan, he would tell us, yeah, it's a good thing for sport to be a, pri to be a private good and make money. But the problem is, since 1992, the world has changed. The world has moved on. Things have developed. Things, more significant things have happened. And, and what has happened in the world, I would call giga changes. So there is a, a very famous marketing author who talks about mega changes, but I, I, I move that on. Since 1992, we've lived in an era of giga changes. And what I mean by giga changes is just such a big mind expandingly huge changes that pervade every single aspect of our lives. So for every single one of us here in this room today, and for every single person across the world right now, these giga changes have impacted upon us. But crucially, crucially in terms of today's lecture, they're also impacting upon sport. So the first giga change that we've seen is globalization. And globalization really is, is significant because it means now we're all interconnected. And the fact that, I, I, I don't know how many, just looking at the, 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 the attendee list today, I would estimate that in this room of 86 people, there are probably at least 20 nationalities. And we, we are connected today, hopefully not just to listen to me, but to, to get some questions too. But we live in, in an era of globalization and interconnectedness that didn't exist, it didn't exist necessarily back in the 19th century. It didn't, didn't even necessarily exist in the middle of the 20th century. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you today using a, an Apple Mac computer, obviously Apple, is, a, is an American brand. I'm an English guy working in France. The actual physical hardware for this uh, um, computer, you know, maybe, maybe it was made in South Korea, possibly. The raw materials, there's a pretty good chance the raw materials came from somewhere like Africa or possibly Australia. And this is globalization. Now, if you begin to trace this through, you can, you can, thinking in terms of globalization, you can think, well, okay, ah, so Newcastle United in the Premier League is owned by the Saudi Arabian government. For that matter, Paris Saint Germain is owned by the Qatari government. And you can begin to see that, that we have this complexity and interconnectedness and these networks that didn't necessarily exist in this way in previous, in previous centuries. But I think what's also significant about globalization is that we now live in a period of history where that 19th century European dominance, keeping in mind that countries like my own had, co had colonies around the world, they'd colonized parts of Africa, parts of South America, parts of Asia. The Europeans economically and political, politically were very powerful. Fast forward through to the 20th century, and obviously European power began to, began to wane and erode, and the United States became more powerful. And so you know, a, a US view of the world, hey, we, you know, we all know McDonald's, we all know Starbucks, we all, we all know Amazon, and we all know Coca-Cola. And, and so 
American dominance economically, politically, socioculturally was, was, uh, was significant. But as we move through the 20th century and particularly into the 21st century, we've seen the rise of China. And, and, and now we know that China in, in, in economic and political terms um, is a rival to the United States. We also see, for example, you know, countries like Indonesia. So very soon, Indonesia will become the fifth largest economy in the world. You know, you've got economies like Russia. The Russian economy is the 11th largest economy in the world. And so what we've seen since, keeping in mind, 1992, is the world has started to pivot. So China has grown in stature, South Korea grown in stature. We see India growing, Malaysia, Indonesia. We've got Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates. So the world is beginning to change. So the first giga change is globalization. And when I mention those country names, China, United Arab Emirates, for example, Abu Dhabi, um, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia. You know, think about think about these countries, and think about them in terms of what is their involvement in sport. Because over the last thirty years, China has become a much more prominent member of the international sporting community. Um, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia has, Qatar has, and this is very much a reflection of this giga trend of globalization. The, the second giga trend is digitalization. And so you know, none of us can, and, and the fact that we're here today, if I go back to when I started my university career back in the, in the 1990s, we couldn't have done this. If you wanted to listen to me, you'd have had to come to my classroom and physically sit in front of me. You know, I remember a world without the internet. I remember a world without mobile phones. I remember a world without Netflix. And yet here we are now, we live in a world of, of, of not just a digitalization, but hyper-digitalization, giga-digitalization, if we could possibly call it that. And this is significant because it is, for example, changing the ways in which people consume things. So the way in which we buy books, the way in which we um, order food, the way in which we deliver sports, the way in which sports are, are staged, the way in which uh, um, you know, sport as a product has evolved and developed has been greatly influenced by digitalization. And, and, and you know, certainly what we do see is, for example, on social media, we see countries using social media and, and their relationship with sport, communicating that through social media to, you know, to essentially to, to, to project themselves, to, to create a view across the world of who they are and what they do. The third giga change is what I would call energy and environment. So, Sport is increasingly being, so we, what we are seeing is, is investments into sport by countries and organizations connected to, to energy. So we mentioned right at the very start, Gazprom and the Champions League. So Gazprom is a, is a, a Russian state-owned gas corporation, somehow involved with the UEFA Champions League. Keep in mind that the, the, the owners of Manchester City and of City Football Group and for, for Chinese, uh, sorry, for Japanese football fans, you'll know that, that City Football Group is, a, is a, a, a significant shareholder in Yokohama. But we know City Football Group has got a franchise in China. It's got a franchise in India. It's got a franchise in France. It's got a franchise in Belgium, in England, in Spain, in Uruguay, in India. Abu Dhabi's wealth is derived from, um, from gas and oil supplies. For that matter, uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia too. So what we're beginning to see is, is this, the, this giga change around energy and environment is really, really significant. Now, why, why the environment part is significant is if we take a country like Saudi Arabia, so Saudi Arabia's wealth is derived from, uh, from oil and gas. 
in most countries across the world now, we have targets in terms of using electric cars. So over the next 10, 20 years, most of us will drive electric cars, which means we no, long, we no longer need petrol, which means for, for countries like Saudi Arabia, they're massively exposed economically. So one of the things that Saudi Arabia has started to do is to use some of its accumulated oil and gas wealth to invest in sport, because what it wants to do is to diversify its economy away from this dependence on oil and gas revenues. So the, the other giga change that we're seeing is, is that we're seeing issues of, of energy use, energy control, degradation of our natural environment and our responses to that, similarly shaping what happens in sport. So this is the world that we live in. This is the world that we live in. So just some core, the causes, globalization, digitalization, energy environment, and some effects. So in terms of uh, globalization, what we now are finding is we, we have opposed ideologies. So the way in which the United States thinks the world should be, and the way in which China thinks the world should be, they're different. We see, for example, through digital, digitalization, we see lifestyle changes. And I've put on the, in the photograph in the sidebar there, Netflix. Who could have imagined? That, like, if you'd said to me even five years ago, Simon, you're going to binge watch a South Korean drama about people killing themselves on, 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 a, on, on a TV connected to the internet and you're going to use a, a subscription service called Netflix, I, I'd have said to you, what are you talking about? You know, what, 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 how can this be? But clearly digitalization is affecting our lives and globalization is part, you know, clearly Squid Games is also evidence of, 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 of globalization too. But digitalization is significant because what we are seeing, for instance, is some of these countries, some of these states, so for example, Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi, they're investing very, very heavily into digital technology and digital platforms because they see this as a way to diversify their economies, but also crucially, they see sport as a really important source of content as part of their digital, the development of their digital um, strategies and these digital platforms. In terms of energy and environment, one of the effects of this is resource control. And, and I'll, I'll flag an example for you very early here. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. So in terms of resource control, we see, for instance, the Chinese government using what's called stadium diplomacy in Africa. So in other words, the Chinese government in Africa is building lots and lots of stadiums for countries free. So the African Cup of Nations just took place in, uh, football's African Cup of Nations just took place in Cameroon and all four stadiums used in the tournament were constructed by the Chinese. Two, two were free. Two were constructed free, two were constructed using what are called soft loans. A soft loan is a, a loan provided at significantly below market rates of interest. So why did China do that? Why did China build sports stadiums in Africa free? Well, one of the things that Africa has is lots of natural resources, lots of oil, lots of gas, lots of rare earths. If you don't know what rare earths are, if you've got a mobile phone, your mobile phone has been made using rare earths. And rare earths, there is a plentiful supply in Africa. So what we see is we see even China using sport, not necessarily because of sport, but they're using sport to achieve other things, which in this particular case is to try and gain access to and control resources in Africa. Now, this is all very different. This is all very different to this utility, Euro, European, this European utilitarian era. 
it also is actually quite different to this North American, or maybe we call it United States era of neoclassicism in sport. So what we're seeing is, is a world that's very different. And you'll notice I've talked about things like states and governments. I've also mentioned Asia quite a lot. I've talked about Indonesia and China and Saudi Arabia and India. You'll also notice that I've talked about things like, you know, when I talked about, when I talked about 19th century England, I didn't talk about digitalization. I, I talked about other things. I, I didn't talk about globalization. Whereas here, what we're saying is, you know, there are some really profound things taking place. So because of these profound changes, what, I th what I'm therefore um, hypothesizing, actually, that's, a, that's, a, that's too much of a posh academic word, hypothesizing. What I'm saying is, what, what, what I think is happening, what I'm telling you is that we're now living in a, in, in a very different era of sport. And rather than sport being utilitarian or neoclassical, what I'm saying is, is, is that sport now is geopolitically economic. And that rather than sport being uh, a public good or sport being a private good, what I think sport now is, is a geopolitically economic good. So in simple terms, it's no longer just about kicking a ball. Otherwise, it's no longer just about making money. It's also about using sport for a combination of geographic, political and economic reasons. Now, some of the, the examples that I gave right at the very start Gazprom, UEFA, the Champions League, I would see that in geopolitically economic terms. You think about Pong Shui, Thomas Bach and the IOC and the Women's Tennis Association, similarly geopolitically economic. Paris Saint-Germain, the Qatari government, you know, sponsorships with Nike and, and, and an endorsement with Jordan. I would see that in geopolitically economic terms. Another example that I would give to you, and, and for me, this guy is, is hugely symbolic of what has happened in our world over the last 30 years. So, of course, you, yeah, you know David Beckham, and you might remember David Beckham. Actually, some of us will remember David Beckham. He, uh, you know, he played for Manchester United. I think he made his debut in like 1995 or 1996. He then, uh, he then married a Spice Girl. Uh, if you don't remember the Spice Girls, Google the Spice Girls. But he then rem uh, married a Spice Girl. And, and he used to appear on the covers of fashion magazines. And he signed lots of endorsement deals. And people even used to start people even even used to talk about brand beckham so people would very often refer to brand beckham so i think brand beckham throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s he was the epitome he was the quintessence of this neoclassical period of sport you want you want david beckham you can have david beckham but you've got to pay for him and so this is very much sport as a private good, sport in terms of commercial gain, sport in terms of making money. However, you fast forward to 2022. So we are, we, we're now getting towards 30 years since David Beckham first made his debut for Manchester United. So it's nearly 30 years since he did that. But you fast forward to 2020 to 2022. And David Beckham is now brand ambassador employed by the Qatari government to promote the 2022 FIFA World Cup in, in Qatar. So he's now a government employee working on behalf of a, of a state, and not a North American state or a European state, working for an Asian state to promote one of their, in, in fact, not one of their, their most important 
national economic and, and industrial development projects, which is the World Cup. So I think if you take where Beckham was and what Beckham was in, 19, in the 1990s and where Beckham is now and what Beckham is now, that in itself is an indication or an illustration of how the world has changed. So how is it? What is it? What do I observe in this geopolitical economy of sport? Well, there's an issue of power and control. So um, the United States and its neoclassical view, it wants to, it wants to, it, it wants to remain powerful and remain in control. Of course, Europeans want to remain powerful and in control. We, we you, keep in mind these 45 sports governing bodies based in Switzerland, you know, still based in Europe. Many of their workers are still European. You know, their cultural influences are still European. So Europeans want to want to maintain their, their, their power and control. But I think what we've said already is, is, is that, that in this world, as it develops, we're seeing interconnectedness and interdependence. We are seeing um, influences exerting themselves upon sports. So just to give you an example, if I may, at that point. So FIFA, which is traditionally a Swiss organization. So FIFA established in Switzerland, still in Switzerland, lots of Swiss people working inside the building. Although it's a global institution, it is still fundamentally a European institution. What FIFA is now considering is should they actually have a, 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 a second headquarters? And the second headquarters, the proposal is to base it in New York. So in effect, you'd have two Swiss headquarters, the kind of bureaucratic and administrative headquarters in Switzerland, you know, very utilitarian. But the FIFA proposal now is to have a second headquarters in New York specifically and deliberately to make even more money. So very neoclassical in its orientation. I can imagine that over the next, in fact, I don't imagine, I predict that sometime over the next 25 years, FIFA will open another headquarters in Asia, maybe in China, maybe in Japan, you know, maybe in Malaysia or Indonesia, maybe Singapore, somewhere like that. But I predict that in the next 25 years, FIFA will, will, um, will have a, a headquartered building uh, in Asia. And that I think very much reflects the development of this geopolitical economy of sport. So the other, one of the other characteristics of this geopolitical economy is the role of states and the role of intervention. And we see the Chinese state intervening in sport very actively. We see the Saudi Arabian state intervening in sport very actively. We see the Qatari government intervening very actively in sport. However, in this geopolitical era that we now live in, the laissez-faire British government, so the, 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 the British government tends not to intervene in sporting matters, period. But in this new geopolitical era that we're living in, even the British government has intervened. So some of you will know last week, the British government sanctioned Roman Abramovich. And what we now have is, is Chelsea Football Club is sanctioned. Um, Roman Abramovich is sanctioned. That is causing all manner of different issues. And, and I guess if we had... You know, if we had six weeks to do to, to, for this for this lecture, we could talk a little bit more about it. But you know, the, I, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, I can I could never have imagined that an English professional football club would be economically and politically sanctioned by the British government, but it has been, and so this is one of the characteristics of sport as a geopolitical economy. If you were to read the paper that I recommended at the start, you'll see that what I say is, is that sport now is an outcome of geography. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate what I mean by these things in just a moment. So sport is an outcome of geography. So the, ge the geographic features of a country will influence how that country engages in 
and uses sport. And when I talk about geography, I'm, I'm talking about physical and human geography. So in the case of Russia, for example, the physical geography of Russia, Russia's got lots of gas, hence Gazprom, hence the UEFA sponsorship. So, you know, that, that is a kind of illustration. Second uh, thing is sport as a means of acquiring and controlling resources. So these could be digital resources. These could be human resources. Uh, I'll give you another example. In this case, sport as a means of acquiring controlling resources. We mentioned China and stadium diplomacy already. One of the things that Qatar has done is to engage in, in what some people refer to as athlete harvesting. So in other words, sending coaches and scouts and managers and talent spotters down into Africa and then identifying talent that then can then be naturalized and become Qatari, become a Qatari athlete. And then that athlete becomes an elite performance athlete. Uh, so this notion of, of acquiring and controlling resources, as I said, digital resources, human resources, financial resources, sport as a focus for soft power uh, and for diplomacy and trade. The example I would use to illustrate this is Great Britain. So the British government does use English Premier League football for lots and lots of different reasons. So you come to Paris right now and, and on the side of the British embassy in Paris is a huge sign that says Britain is great. And there's a picture of a Premier League player there. Britain is great. So what Britain is trying to do is to use football and to use the Premier League as an instrument of soft power. The British, we, we, want, we want you to like us because we're a bit dysfunctional at the moment and a bit kind of crazy. So you know, we want the world to like us and, and, and we, we use soft power and we use the Premier League as part of trying to project that, that soft power so we can build relations, relationships across the world. Sport is being used to achieve national competitive advantage. So for anybody in the room who's sat in from South Korea, one of, the, one of the things that the South Korean government has done over the last five years is to create an, 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 an industrial strategy for eSport. And this industrial strategy is not necessarily about you know, lots of young kids playing console games. The industrial strategy is about being the world's number one hardware producer. So producing consoles, for instance, if you produce consoles, you need workers to do that. Uh, those workers are gonna pay taxes. They're gonna produce an output, output that can be sold overseas for export. There's exports earning. There's a contribution to national income. So countries are now using sport to try and achieve a national competitive advantage. So South Korea is an example of a country that is trying to build a, a, a competitive advantage, a national competitive advantage in sports. And sport is also a, a way of, of, of building networks. I mentioned City Football Group um, earlier. So City Football Group, based on Manchester City in England, Manchester City is a classic, you, uh, um, ut util utilitarian organization. So Manchester City set up in the east side of Manchester during the Industrial Revolution, uh, the greatest good for the greatest number. And yet here we are now, Manchester City is owned by the Abu Dhabi government, as well as um, investors from China and the United States. But what City Football Group has done is to establish this network and this network serves different purposes in different marketplaces. So the franchise in France, for example, is very much about talent acquisition. So it's about acquiring resources. Whereas in China, so when a city football group bought the club in Chengdu, it had a much, much more political basis to it. But essentially city football group has created this network for a combination of geographic, political, and economic reasons. So whilst you try to guess the flag, I'm gonna drink some water. And I'm also gonna check the time. We will come to an end soon. So for those of you who don't know the flag, the flag is Qatar. 
And if I was to choose one country that I think embodies the geopolitical economy of sport, I think it's Qatar. And just to give you a, a quick overview of why I think Qatar is a great illustration is Qatar is very, very small. Until 1971, it was a British protectorate. Normally, when I ask people about Qatar, I say, them, hey, what do you know about Qatar? And, and they'll say, lots of sand. And I think if you were to go back to 1971, there were probably two things you could say about Qatar. Lots of sand, lots of oil and gas. So essentially, for most of us in the world, I guess a way to, to, to think about this is, is when we talk about Japan, when Europeans talk about Japan, we talk about electronic goods and we talk about Sony and we talk about, um, you know, we talk about sushi, we talk about Mount Fuji, we talk about, you know, maybe even kawaii and, and kind of cute things. So, you know, that's how we talk about Japan. If we were to talk about the United States, we would talk about McDonald's and Hollywood, and we talk about um, the Statue of Liberty, and, and we talk about you know, cowboys or you know, whatever else we talk. So you know, we would talk about we would talk about um, uh, about the United States in that way. Certainly, going back ten years ago, possibly even now, when when people talk about Qatar. You know, probably don't talk about anything because nobody nobody really knows Qatar for anything. So in terms of in terms of our associations with Qatar, most of us probably wouldn't have a lot to say about Qatar. So what Qatar has therefore done as a essentially as a very small, you know, with no disrespect, nondescript country. What Qatar has done is it has engaged in nation building and it has used sport and in particular the FIFA World Cup as an exercise in nation building. And what this means therefore is, is when we talk about Qatar now, we talk about the World Cup and we talk about Paris Saint-Germain and we talk about Neymar and we talk about Mbappe and we talk about Qatar won the, uh, won the Asian Cup in 2019, Qatar even beat Japan. So what Qatar has done is, is to invest into sport, partly because many of us can now talk about the country, we have associations with the country, but crucially, and one of the most significant things, one of the most significant geographic features of what Qatar is doing, geographic features of what Qatar is doing, is it's based on oil, oil and gas. So oil and gas is powering what, what Qatar does. So the physical geography of Qatar resulted in Neymar, resulted in Qatar staging the World Cup at the end of this year. Just a quick, a quick one on the human geography of Qatar. The human geography of Qatar is really interesting. There are 3 million, 3 million people in Qatar, 3 million. So it's not even as big as Tokyo. There are 3 million people in Qatar. 10% of the Qatari population is Qatari. So 300,000 people are Qataris. So technically there are only 300,000 Qataris in the whole world. But what this means domestically in terms of the human geography of Qatar, is that building a coherent national identity, building social cohesion is actually a challenge. And sport is one of the ways in which Qatar is trying to bring its dis disparate population together. So that's the, ge the, the geography of Qatar. But in terms of, um, in terms of the politics, Certainly one of the things that, that, that uh, Qatar has, has done is very actively engage in project, trying to project soft power. And we alluded to this earlier, soft power is, is attractive power. It's, it's, it's a way of getting people to, to look at you and to like you and to understand you 
and to share the same things as 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 they do. You know, share the things that they like and share the things that they want. Share the same values that they have as as as, as we. Of course, football is a great example of that. So Qatar, Qatar understands the soft power of football. Qatar knows that by engaging in football, by buying Paris Saint-Germain, it allows you to develop relationships across the world that previously weren't there. So there's very definitely a political dimension to, um, to what Qatar is doing. So the World Cup is heading to Qatar because in essence, this is Qatar trying to, to build its identity, but also to project its soft power and to show us all that they love football as well. You know, they, just like us, they love football as well. And what this will mean, therefore, is, is, is if they can demonstrate that they, they like the same things as we do, they want the same things as we do. That's very much what soft power is about. Now, I am generalizing in terms of geography and, and, and politics because I, I do want to draw things to a close. But, of course, we also need to think in terms of um, the economics. So the, there is hard economics behind this because for those of you who are contemplating going to Qatar uh, to watch the World Cup, most of you will fly into Doha Airport. You know, whether you're in Tokyo or Paris or London or you know, New York or wherever it is in the world, you're probably going to have to fly Qatar Airways. And, and Qatar Airways is a state, state-owned Qatari airline. You I challenge anyone in the room today, you try and get into Qatar on an airline that isn't Qatar Airways because the number of slots allocated to non Qatar Airways airlines at, at Hamad International Airport is very, very small. So most of you who go to the World Cup are going to have to fly Qatar, Qatar Airways. Now, what this means is, of course, you're going to buy your ticket. Um, you're going to fly on Qatar Airways. All of the money that you spend goes back to Qatar. You're going to stay in a hotel. Uh, very often the hotels, you know, even if it's the Sheraton or the Four Seasons or you know, the Holiday Inn or the Radisson, you know, very often these are these are state sponsored hotels. They're facilitated by the state. So you'll stay in hotels and revenues will go to the, the, the government. What we do know about sports events is people who go to sports events are more likely to go back to a country if they've already been there once to watch sport. So that, this means that some of you in the room today, you'll go and watch the World Cup and then sometime in the future, you'll think, ah, I liked it there. Or, ah, I want to go on a, a sunshine holiday. I'll take Qatar Airways to Qatar and I'll spend in a hotel. And so it's really important to think in terms of how these things interconnect. And I talked about interdependence and interconnectedness and Qatar is a great example of that. Some other illustrations I've talked about Saudi Arabia. I talk, I've talked about Britain too. I haven't talked about is Denmark. You know, Denmark again is trying to build national competitive competitive advantage in esports. Uh, look at Israel, where the government is supporting the development of. Uh, a sports tech startup hub. So Israel wants to become the sports tech startup capital of the world. And if you want to know more, if you want, if you're interested in Israel and you're interested in sports tech tech startups, you know, get in contact with me. But the crucial thing is that this is very much global, interconnected, interdependent. There may be some utilitarian principles underpinning this. There may be some neoclassical principles underpinning this, but there's very heavy state involvement. There are features of geography, politics, economics. Hence, it is the geopolitical economy of sport. So to conclude, one of my students last November said to me after class, I'm really scared. And I know well, why? Why are you scared? And they say, you scared us with your class. You've scared us. It's a really scary place. The world is a really scary place. So 
what I want to say to everybody today is kids, don't be scared. You know, don't be scared. When they write, about, you know, in, in two or three centuries time, when historians are writing about this period when we're all here together, and we are all here together, we're all sharing the planet at the same time right now. But when historians look back on this period, they'll say, whoa, what an incredible period in history that was. <clears throat> so my view of the world is don't be scared, just, just enjoy the ride or try to enjoy the ride because the world is an incredible place, but it is changing very, very quickly. And what this is doing is it's challenging the global sport hegemony. And what I mean by this is sport is no longer utilitarian. Sport is no longer neoclassical. I argue that sport is now geopolitical. And so this, this is having an impact upon who owns sport, who runs sport, how sport is governed, where events are staged. This really means that we need to have a different view of the world. Because if you, if you go back 30 years ago, Saudi Arabia was not impacting upon global sport in a significant way. China was not impacting upon global sport in a significant way. Russia wasn't impacting upon global sport in a significant way. All of those countries now are, but what's starting to happen is the United States and Britain and Japan and France and Germany and South Africa and India are trying to compete. They're trying to compete economically and politically with Russia. They're trying to compete economically and politically with China. So we've got to start looking at the world in the world of sport in a different way. And this new way I advocate is this geopolitical economy of sport. Just one more for further reading and I will try, as I say, I will try to post the URL um, in, uh, uh, in the chat forum in just a moment. This is very short. If you don't want to read a long journal article, you just want to read a shorter piece. This is like 900 words. Um, so I, 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 I wrote this, but it's, it's only like 800 words. So I'll post this in, uh, in, in, in a moment. Eileen Gu, some of you may, um, some of you may recognize Eileen Gu, who uh, won gold medals for skiing, freestyle skiing at the Beijing Games uh, back in February. She is, in many ways, an, the embodiment of the geopolitical economy, economy of sport. So American father, Chinese mother, chose to, was born and brought up in the United States, is about to go to university in the United States, but chose to ski for China in the Olympic Games. She's got big, big endorsement deals, for example, with Red Bull. So in some ways, you know, she's very much part of that neoclassical um, sporting system, a big, big Red Bull sponsorship deal. Yet at the same time, in making the decision to ski for China, and if you look at what happened with Eileen Gu during the Winter Olympic Games, a hugely politicized and geopolitic geopolitical figure during the Games. So I think for, for me, Eileen Gu, I think Eileen Gu is 18 or 19 years old. You know, she really is a, is a symbol of this complex, interdependent, ideologically charged, interconnected world that we live in. And now I'm gonna shut up. So thank you for inviting me to do this. Thank you for being very patient and listening to me. And Chairwoman Donna, I guess you are, uh, you're now back in charge. So why, the, the middle-class, middle-aged white man from Europe is going to shut up now. And uh... Thank you for the interesting insight. So we probably um, have time for a few questions. But before we open it up to the floor, I believe um, Mortez Bishara did ask a question, I think. Uh, would you like to ask him yourself? Or Mortez, are you here? Hi, yes, Hello. I'm here. <laughs> I'm not, not sure if my microphone is working. We yeah, it's you. working, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess that just what was on my mind is now that um, Chelsea 
has been sanctioned, uh, there seems to be a much bigger scrutiny on the purchase of, of Newcastle uh, by the Saudis and, you know, the obviously the association with the, the Saudi government and its, uh, its actions in Yemen and the actions of, you know, um, what happened with Jamal Khashoggi. Um, how do you think that plays out and how does the government justify sort of sanctioning, I'm not a Chelsea fan by any means, but sanctioning, you know, one club and not sanctioning another club um, that has perhaps even more direct links with a, with a country that, you know, is questionable? I think that's a really, uh, really great question. Um, I mean, clearly, so the, this geopoliticization of sport, I think, was already happening before uh, before Abramovich and Chelsea, and and you can trace trace its roots or its origins back through, for example, Saudi Arabia and Newcastle United. And what strikes me about all of this is is what am I what am I trying to say? Fundamentally, it's a governance issue. It's a governance issue because. During that, during the, the the Saudi Arabian takeover of Newcastle United, there were there were few, if any, red lines drawn. And obviously, in the case of of, of um, Chelsea and Abramovich case, we very very quickly drawn some red lines. I would use the comparison as well of, of Gazprom and UEFA. So Gazprom signed a deal with UEFA back in two thousand thirteen, and UEFA renewed that deal with Gazprom last year. Now, keep in mind that last year, uh, Russia had already invaded Crimea. It had already shot down MH11. It had already uh, killed political dissidents in the center of Moscow. And yet UEFA still signed a renewal of its deal. In fact, an extension and, and a development of its deal with Gazprom. And yet what we've had over the last three weeks is, is UEFA very, very quickly saying, OK, we're drawing some red lines. Now, where we draw those red lines over the last three weeks seems to have been very arbitrary without any particular consideration. And, and, and we do get, Motes, this, this, this what seems like a contradiction. So Saudi Arabia attacks Yemen and nothing happens, and the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Funds buy, buys Newcastle United. Uh, but then Russia invades Ukraine, and suddenly the Premier League starts drawing red lines everywhere and saying this is unacceptable. And so you've got a, you know, between even between 2021 and 2022, you've got a contradiction between the two. Now, there are some people in the room today who are going to say, well, actually, What's happening in Yemen is very different to, to, to what's happening in Ukraine. And Saudi Arabia is a different country to, uh, to Russia. And what Saudi Arabia is trying to do and what its motives are are different to Russia's. And some people will say, well, Brit Britain sells lots and lots of weapons to Saudi Arabia. It doesn't sell any weapons to, uh, to, to Russia. But you know, it's almost, in some ways, it's almost as though that, that is, is immaterial. Because for us working in sport, what it does mean, I, I think that the Premier League has contradicted itself. It can be accused of inconsistency and hypocrisy. But what we do now know is we, you know, sport exists in a world and we make decisions as people in sport within an environment that is actually very complex. And moving forward from here, I think in governance terms, moving forward from here, we do need to think about number one, is, are the systems of governance that we have in, in global sport robust enough and fit for purpose in this complex world? But I think also, and, and, and I think I'm thinking specifically here of the Premier League, if, we, if we're now in the era where we draw red lines, we, we, we're in an era where we're saying we, we're not going to cross this line. What sport organisations will need to do uh, we'll be very clear about where those red lines are drawn on, and on what basis decisions will be made. I had a conversation yesterday, no, Tuesday, with a Waseda student from China. And the Waseda student from China said, what happens if China invades Taiwan? 
will FIFA terminate all its sponsorship deals with with Chinese brands, Chinese companies? Yeah. So will it? I don't know. Will it? Maybe. You know. Interestingly, FIFA doesn't have sponsorships with 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 Russian companies, but FIFA does have. I think in the last count, maybe six or seven deals with Chinese companies. Will it terminate this? I don't think we can say yes or no. We just don't know. But I think in terms of good governance, rather than arbitrarily drawing red lines over, over a space of two or three weeks, it is almost as though we need a new deal for sport governance. And that for me is really, really the really significant part of this. Just if I could just say one more thing, because I know other people want to ask questions too. At Chelsea, it would appear that there is interest from a, a Saudi Arabian a billionaire who wants to buy Chelsea. And all, already questions are being asked, you know, who is this guy and does he have connections to the government? And, and if he does have connections to the government, what will that mean in terms of the Newcastle United ownership, which essentially is a government entity? So it is not inconceivable that you could have two Saudi Arabian organizations owning clubs in the Premier League at the same time, keeping in mind that the guy who potentially may buy Chelsea, he's not a member of the royal family, he's, he runs his own business. However, you cannot run a business in, in Saudi Arabia. You cannot successfully run a business in Saudi Arabia without some sort of connection to the state. So if you've got the state running Newcastle, owning and running Newcastle United, and then, you, then you, you've got some kind of state relationship at Chelsea, you know, Saudi Arabian state relationship at Chelsea, what will the Premier League do? So there is a big, there's, there's a big governance issue. So I think fundamentally there's a govern, what we've seen particularly over the last two or three weeks poses big, big, big governance questions for, for, uh, for world sport. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. It's a big question. Thank you. We'll come back next week and do it. Well, we'll come back next week and do it again. Mr. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, Mr. Robert Casper, or should I say, Dr. Robert Casper? Yes, uh, Mate sorry, um, my, uh, Robert. Sorry, I think Matteo asked the question first. You, you come right, okay. after him if that's all right with you. Thank you. Sure. Hi. So thanks, Professor, for the. Um, for the, for the whole presentation, which I, I enjoyed as much as reading the paper, which I recommend to everyone. And I have a question. In the paper, you mentioned also speaking about the new geopolitical economy of sport, how this requires basically sports management as a sector, researchers, and also policymakers maybe, to have a, a new view of sport, which basically takes these factors into account, which I wholly agree with. And I found interesting um, recently the divergence between how, as you said, Thomas Bach in the IOC approached this, uh, the, the Olympics, trying to make it as apolitical as possible. And then, uh, well, putting it into comparison with uh, Andrew Parsons in the opening ceremony of the of the Paralympics, where he took a more maybe political uh, approach and, and spoke about the invasion of Ukraine and ended with his impassioned call for, for peace at the end of the speech. And I think it makes a stark contrast between the two of them. Um, okay, can I, so, where, sorry, Matteo. Can, can I just yeah. interject to that point? My apologies. Where are you, Matteo? Where, where are you, Matteo, right now? I'm in Spain. I'm in Spain right now. Okay, so what you, what I heard in France and you heard in Spain, so when Andrew Parsons spoke, yeah. what I heard in France and you heard in Spain is different to what my students in China heard because that deep, deeply impassioned speech where he talked about war and the need for peace. And we heard that, yeah, we heard that. And we believe that, right? You know, we believe that there should be peace and you, know, you shouldn't invade other countries and 
you know, which is a bit ironic for, for the Spanish and the Br British to be saying don't invade other countries is ironic. But that, you know, but that, that, that's, that's, that's another issue. But what we, what we heard is not what they heard in China, because you may know that the way in which this was presented is, you know, it was blanked out. Chinese people didn't hear this. And you'll notice in the slides that I talked about this kind of ideological polarization or this ideological contesting. In the West, we're entitled to hear that kind of thing. In the East, in China, you're not entitled to hear that kind of thing. And I make no judgment of that. I'm not going to make a value judgment. We heard it. They didn't. Back to you, Matteo. No, I think I'm... That's a good thing to point out. I wasn't gonna, gonna say it. And uh, I wanted to ask specifically, um, how do you interpret this difference in, in their approach, whether, and also whether you think that um, we will see in the future more of this latter um, approach to basically politicizing sports or more of the former trying to keep and politics as a way as possible. Thanks. My, I, I think sport has always been political because as soon as you uh, as soon as you create a set of rules, as soon as you establish a sport and create a set of rules, that's political. So I actually, I, I, I think I tweeted this last week. You know, when you decide it's eleven players against eleven players pay, playing for ninety minutes, a goal at each end of the pitch. That was a political decision. So sport is inherently political. What we're seeing now, I think, is something different. It's actually geopolitical rather than political. So this is not about this is not about bureaucrats and administrators designing a sports competition. This is about countries almost deploying sport. It's almost like a weapon. So you know, as, a, as a way of, you know, whether it's a hard power weapon or a soft power weapon, you know, essentially what countries are doing, and I, I take my, my own country again, Britain, and I reiterate that example of, of, of the way in which the British government around the world, not, not just in France, but in China, in Japan, you know, in, in Africa, in South America, the way in which the British government uses um, soft power in the Premier League to, to, to build relationships. This is not political, this is geopolitical. And, and, and that, as I said, for me, that is the big thing. That is the big thing. Where we are now is not, not just political. Sport has always been political. Where we are now is it's geopolitical and, and, and the, the, the geographic dimension is significant. But it's not, geo, it's not just geopolitical, it's also economic too, because you know, it is about money and jobs. So, you know, you take Chelsea as the example. The merchandise store has been closed down. And, and, be, and, and people worked in that store. That was their job. You know, they, they, earned, they earned money. They got a salary for doing that. So we, you know, it's very much, it's not just geopolitics, it's economics too. And, and this will continue. I don't see I don't see this ending anytime soon. This will continue. And I think that again, I'll predict you know, in, in 2050, it will still be like this. That's what I think. In 2050, it will still be like this. Now, of course, what's happening in 2070 or 2080 or 2090, maybe I might still be around. I suspect not. But maybe in 2070 or 2080 or 2090. It will look different, but I think that the situation as it is now, it will still be the same. It, it, it might have, it, it will have changed some of its characteristics. It will have evolved. It will have developed, but essentially, this geopolitical economy of sport will still exist in 2050. That's what I believe. If I'm wrong, you can come and find me and tell me, Simon, you were wrong. Which will be great because it means I'll still be alive in 2050. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Right. Um, it's Robert next. Yeah, thanks, Simon, for a great and insightful lecture. And uh, just like to add one question and one remark on this geopolitical picture. <clears throat> I'm actually te teaching now from a COVID 
isolation to my students at the Hague University of Applied Sciences Sports Management Program. The students are coming from all across Europe and now joining your lecture in Japan. So thanks for allowing us uh, in. Uh, really fascinating how this world has evolved. And I think we also have to see the positive side of the past two years that this is possible actually. But my question is more complicated. Let's assume that Russia and the Ukraine conflict is in this spring sorted out. It's somehow peaceful, whatever the outcome is. What's your advice, Simon, to UEFA and to other World Sports Federation? If it's just some, some kind of frozen conflict, no more armed conflict, what's your suggestion? Shall all the sanctions be lifted? Shall the Russian clubs be allowed to play again? Shall the athletes be immediately allowed to play again? How shall the world of sports react once there is some kind of peaceful solution? Thanks for your question, Robert, and I'm not going to answer it. At least I'm not going to answer it directly. Uh, so I, again, one of the things that um, that I, I, I tweeted last week is, is what is the roadmap for Russia's reintegration into the global sport community? And, and, and I guess my answer to your question is, your, is, is what you said in your question, which is very simply, you know, let's say, for example, the conflict ends on the 1st of May. Do we just say, oh, great, okay. So UEFA can go back to its Gazprom sponsorship. Uh, Russian athletes can participate in the, the Olympic Games again. Um, we'll all live happily ever after and we forget about this, you know, forget it ever happened. Or are we going to be deeply suspicious of, of, of Russia? Are we going to be deeply suspicious of, of companies that want to sponsor sports across the world? Are we going to be suspicious? You know, when, we, when, when that Russian gymnast wins four gold medals at the Paris 2024 Games, you know, are we going to be thinking, is that really true? You know, surely they must have doped. You know, and, and, and I think that the Russian doping scandal is all part of this geopolitical economy. So we do need a, a roadmap. We need to decide. I, again, I think there is a governance issue there. The governance issue for, for me is, is, is a particularly interesting one because what I would, you know, I think what I would like to see is global sport as a community deciding what that what a common approach should be so you know what universal standards are going to be adopted because it's conceivable that what football says and what athletics says and what ice hockey says and what basketball says and what formula formula one says could be completely different and so there is this kind of post ukraine um confusion about which sports are taking which measures and and i, and I don't know how you achieve that but it does occur to me that that you know once 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 the light has gone from red to green and we can all race back in again that 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 we'll forget the lessons or we'll forget to learn the lessons of what's been happening recently. Fundamentally, at the heart of this is is for me is it is the issue of trust. So how can we trust Russia again? How can we trust? Uh, its athletes, how can we trust its sponsors? How can we trust you? Know, well, let, let's say, for example, when you know, the, the, uh, uh, the 2040 Olympic Games goes to Moscow, you know, how can we trust that the Russians are, are, are not fooling us, that its athletes are not doped? It's very easy to use this word trust for the academics amongst you, and I'm guessing most of us are academics here today, you know, for the academics amongst you, go into Google Scholar and, and put, put trust into Google Scholar and see what comes out. Because trust is, it. Trust is you know, if, if trust was easy, we'd all trust each other. But the reality is that we don't all trust each other and, and trust is very difficult to achieve. But I do think it's important for the sport community to understand what trust is. And, and how trust is built, because that for me, this roadmap in terms of um, moving forward and uh, here, here and, and readmitting Russia into the international sport community, sport community, as I say, it's going to be based on, on, on this notion of trust. The other thing I think as well in terms of this Russian roadmap is it shouldn't just be restricted 
to Russia. My personal view is if one country illegally invades another country, <clears throat> then that country should be suspicious. Its membership of the IOC, for example, should be suspended for a period of time that we can define. Now, this would be really significant if we were to go back to 2003, when Britain and the United States and several other countries illegally invaded Iraq. So they, they, they didn't. They weren't you know, sanctioned or illegal, illegal, sorry, legally permitted to do that. It was an illegal invasion. So are we really saying that back in 2003 across the world that the Premier League should have been banned from TV screens across the world? You know, in, in some ways, we, you know, Brit Britain and the United States did what Russia has just done. And Russia has been penalized, but we weren't. So what I would like to see in terms of moving forward is, is, is I, I, I used the phrase earlier, a new deal. I think there needs to be a new deal for global sports. And, and this shouldn't just be about sanctioning and penalizing Russia. We have as a global sport community an opportunity to, to, to think more carefully about how we govern sport. But also I think, I, I mentioned the issue of trust with Russia. We know that over the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years, people don't trust governing bodies. Sports fans don't trust FIFA. After the Pong Shui episode last November, you know, people don't trust the IOC. So this is not just an opportunity to, to try and build, re, rebuild or reestablish trust with, um, with Russia. I think it's also an opportunity for global, the global sport community to think more generally about in terms of how we govern and, and, and how we run sports, how we stage sports competitions. You know, how, can we, how can we rebuild some of the trust that has been lost over the last 10 or, 10 or 20 years? So I didn't answer your question. I know that. But one of the things I will be thinking about in the coming weeks is, you know, what's the way forward? You know, very simply, what's the way forward? On and and then we, let's let's Robert, let's pose this as a question for the group. That's their homework for tonight. We're both academics, so we need to set homework. You know, on on what basis should Russia be readmitted into into sport? Because it's not going to be easy. Um, it's it, it it will be difficult and strange decisions will be made and some organizations will base the, their decisions on money rather than morality or geopolitics so you know, i think that's a really it's a i'm glad you asked the question robert and i don't think there's an answer yet but homework for tonight everybody can think go away and think about it simon you're aware that this is recorded right <laughs> i didn't you swear did i you, you have KGB lining up tomorrow, maybe at your doorstep, so. <laughs> so yes. they're, already, they're, they're already there now. <sighs> yes. It's F FS, FSB nowadays, Donna. FSB, oh, okay. not KGB, FSB. <laughs> yes, um, next we have Anirudh. Do you want to ask something? Yeah, sure, thank you. Can you hear me, Simon? Anirudh, you could have asked me this question, uh, like in, in, Anirudh's one of my students. Yeah. We could have met we could have met for coffee in Paris and talked about this. Go on, Annie Rose. Yeah, Away. just a quick one. So so I don't take much of time when other people can ask. Uh, great presentation. I, I like the simplicity uh, with which it was delivered and the examples were exactly pinpoint. I, I was just wondering out of all the examples, did you just miss out on visit Ravanda on the sleeves of Arsenal and PSG and also visit Florida on the sleeves of Fulham? I mean, given that. Uh, French and English are the official languages of Rwanda. Rwanda is also one of the highest uh, exporter for Colton, which is used for mobile phone batteries. And uh, uh, Florida, when they came up with this uh, uh, idea of becoming a sponsor of a full ham, uh, it was, I mean, Britishers or people coming from UK were the third highest visitor in that region. So, so I'm going to mention. I'm going to, I'm going to respond directly to you, and then I'm going to mention another example. So the first direct response to you is, um, 
you talked about Visit Rwanda and Paris Saint-Germain. So Visit Rwanda uh, has a, a, a sponsorship deal with Paris Saint-Germain. Paris Saint-Germain is owned by the Qatari government. Uh, the Qatari government owns, owns Qatar Airways. Uh, and Qatar Airways owns a significant stake in Air Rwanda. So in terms of uh, triangulation, fantastic example, Annie Arud, because I think, check out what Qatar Airways is doing with, with Rwanda. And, and you've got the triangle. Is it Rwanda, Paris Saint-Germain, or is it a square, or maybe something else, a pentagon? Um, so visit Rwanda, Paris Saint-Germain, Qatar Sports Investment, Qatar Airways, Qatar Airways, Air Rwanda, Air Rwanda, Visit Rwanda. Um, so that's one. The example that we didn't mention, Annie Arud, which we absolutely should have mentioned, is uh, summer 2020, when Indian troops and Chinese troops start fighting each other on the border. So some of you will know that, that India and China share a border. Uh, in the end, I think it was 20 soldiers, 20 Indian soldiers were killed, right, Annie Arud? So 20 Indian soldiers uh, were killed by Chinese troops on the border in, a, in this border skirmish. This should have absolutely nothing to do with sport. If people choose to shoot each other on a, on a border, it should have absolutely nothing to do with sport. But when this played through, there was huge, <clears throat> a huge public outcry in India. And this resulted in uh, Vivo, so some of you will know, Vivo is a Chinese mobile phone um, company. So Vivo's sponsorship of Indian Premier League cricket, Indian Premier League cricket, India's biggest sporting competition. You know, most Indians live for Indian Premier League cricket. Vivo was sponsoring that. China's Vivo was sponsoring that competition. That was it. Deal over. And, and, and so that is... you. you the, that again is a great example in terms of two sets of soldiers fighting on a border shouldn't have implications for a sports sponsorship program, but they did. So you had the geography, there's this kind of territorial dispute between India and China. You've got the politics, the politics obviously in terms of the military, uh, military conflict and the stance of the respective governments. And then that plays through in terms of the sponsorship and consumption of mobile phones and Indian Premier League cricket. And so that's another really, really great example. So Indian Premier League cricket and Vivo, if people don't, don't, don't know this example, um, Google it. Or if you're in China, use another search engine. Thank you. Um, we'll take one last question from Shelley. Thank you, Donna. Um, and thank you very much, Simon, for your presentation. Really, really interesting. Um, the one thing that I would like to ask, and perhaps this is on a more simple level, but throughout everything that you you discussed and the changes, you know, from the utility, you know, to, into neoclassical, and then, you know, now into your geopolitical, where do the athletes stand, and and what role do they play, in, and and what does their future look like? I understand, like I'm, I know that in terms of globalization, you, you know, we're seeing international recruitment and scouting. So, and and there's broadcasting, but are they? What is your perception of the athletes? Are they just sort of pieces on a chessboard, or what? Where where do they fit in? It's it. My normal reaction to, 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 to such questions is is to say it depends where you are in the world. It's depend, it depends which living room you're sat in. So if you're sat in a living room in Shanghai or you're sat in a living room in Mumbai or a living room in Paris or a living room in London or in New York, that will shape the way in which you see these uh, the, these kinds of instances and episodes. So if I can, just to give you an example. Um, we, if we take somebody like uh, Colin Kaepernick, or for that matter, Lewis Hamilton, we take Lewis Hamilton. So Lewis Hamilton is uh, sees it as his right. He is entitled to engage in all manner of political protests 
uh, before races, after races, Formula One races. And so we've, we've seen, for example, Lewis Hamilton during races wearing a helmet with LGBTQ stripes and, and support for, for, for that community. We've also seen him um, taking a knee before races to uh, show solidarity with the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we've also seen him take his overalls off to reveal T-shirts with political messaging. Uh, you know, clearly he is a man. He, if you know Lewis, he's he he's got lots of uh, he's got lots of tattoos. He um, you know, he makes very strident socio-political statements. One of the things that he's done uh, recently in Britain is he's he's trying to set up a black motorsport academy. So he you know, he sees it as his right to be actively engaged in geopolitical, sociocultural issues and to have an opinion and to be able to express that opinion and engage in actions which he feels are appropriate and acceptable. At the turn of the year, the Chinese Football Association introduced a, a regulation which basically has said uh, male and female footballers from now on, if you get a tattoo, you will be banned from playing for the national team. Similarly, they've been told, if you dye your hair, if you dye your hair, which is something I used to do quite a lot, um, if you dye your hair, you will be banned from participating for the Chinese national team. And so what you have is, is a much more controlled, prescriptive, interventionist, you know, some people might call it authoritarian. Some people might even call it dictatorial. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge either the Western way or the Chinese way or anybody else's way. But I think clearly as athletes, <clears throat> what this means is, 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 is what, who you are, what you say, what you do, how you behave, what you feel you can engage in will be socioculturally and politically prescribed for you. You know, as, a, as, a, as a West European man, you know, I'm well aware of what I can say and do, but I can see that if I was uh, you know, somebody in China, I, I'm, again, I've got lots of Chinese students and I, and I know the ways in which they can and they can't express themselves. So unfortunately, I mean, I, I think fortunately, athletes are still going to be able to make dis their own decisions within the context of the prevailing ideology of the environment in which they participate. But I think what we, what, what we do know, what we do see is, is that clearly what an athlete can say and do in China is very different to what an athlete can say and do in, in, in Britain. Where this does raise an issue again, and again, it's a, it, I think it's a governance issue because you've got this, um, You've got this situation whereby you know, you've got athletes doing certain things in one country and then doing completely different things in another country and governing bodies not really understanding the geopolitical and cultural nuances of all of this and, and, and getting completely tied up in knots about how to respond to this. So you know, we go back to Matteo's example earlier. In, in our part of the world, Matthew, it's, 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 it's perfectly acceptable to speak openly and publicly and say what we want. You know, that's our right. But of course, in other parts of the world, it's not necessarily the case. And, and what, what, for example, the IOC or FIFA face is, is they're saying no, no form of individual self-expression at all. No form of individual self-expression. So you can't wear that T-shirt and you can't carry that flag. And you can't speak out publicly on that issue. That, that, and and that could, this then comes back to this issue of trust as well, because you know, people like Matteo and me and, and Robert and others in the room will say, hold on a minute, we're from Western Europe, we can say what we want. And one of the things that I, I, I don't think that, that governing bodies of sport have got to grips with, particularly in terms of athletes, is, is accounting for the, the, the diverse and complex 
geopolitical differences that sometimes exist, not just between the athletes themselves, but but you know the, be, between the countries in which those athletes um, were born and raised, but also participate. I've got to confess, I don't have any solutions right now. I, I don't know what the solution is to all of this. This is one of the things, as I said to Robert, I'm going to think about. What I do, however, think is, is it, it's, I, I believe that it is not inconceivable that if we continue in this really fractious period, it's not inconceivable that we'll start to see sports governing, or global sports start to splinter. And so, you know, it's, it's not inconceivable that we'll get rival tournaments, we'll get rival competitions. You know, I guess an extreme example is you would have two Olympic Games. You would have an Olympic Games based out of Switzerland and you would have an Olympic Games based out of Moscow. And those that are allied with, with Moscow will participate in that Olympic Games. And those that are allied with kind of more liberal Western values will participate in the Swiss version of the Olympic Games. And it might sound ludicrous and it might sound bizarre and possibly it is a completely ludicrous thing to say. But when you look at the history of sport, when there are significant political differences that can't be resolved, sports sometimes splinter. You know, look at boxing. Look at the number of different codes in boxing. You know, for political reasons, boxing, those governing bodies splintered. And we're living in, a, in this highly charged geopolitical environment where global score, the system of global sport could splinter. So going back to the question that was asked, you know, we could get the you know, athletes with liberal Western values participating in sports or participating in events that, in events that do allow statements of self-expression or show displays of self-expression. Then you'll have those events that are owned and run by states where that form of individual self-expression or this dis display of individual self-expression is not permitted. You know, that is possible, the splintering of the global sports system. So I kind of answered your question, but didn't. It's no. just such a, it, it's just so complicated. Yeah, no, that, yeah, it's definitely, it definitely helps. It is, it's so, so complex and, and scary actually. In my opinion. Don't be scared, don't be scared. <laughs> Uh, please don't be scared uh, <laughs> thank you i mean i mean can i can i just make a, a statement on behalf of all of the academics in the room and, and there are some academics in the room uh, we now need so the the students in our classes you know we, we need to teach our students well that's one thing but the the students in the room today there's a big responsibility on your shoulders now because you're the leaders and you're the next generation of leaders and managers. So you've got to, you've got to think very, very carefully and very seriously about what's happening in the, in the world of sport today. Because what happens in 2030 and 2040 and 2050, you're the people who are going to be making the decisions. So you know, we, 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 do, we, we need to train you well as academics. We need to train you well and educate you well. But you, in the end, you're going to be the people who, who come up with solutions to some of the problems that we face. And this is not a scary thing. This is just an incredible thing. Because so, you know, somebody sat in the room today you know, could go on to become director of policy at FIFA or dire director of international relations at the IOC. So you know, do, do take what's happening seriously, but see it as an opportunity as well. Because you're going to be, you're going to be the people who... who change this situation thank you simon that's nicely concluded <laughs> so with that uh, i'm afraid we have to bring this session to a close so thank you all for attending so you have if you have further questions um which you don't get a chance to ask um feel free to email simon i'm sure he'll be happy to engage with you and i don't want to you know what i, I don't i don't want to open my email account now i, I really don't so for those who have missed the first part of the lecture, um, the recording of this session will be made available in YouTube shortly with the uh, link available at Poseida um, University website, or you can also access it, I think, via Simon's Twitter. So um, yes, I, I hope that this will be um, start of a beautiful conversation on this like sports and geopolitics 
and hopefully we'll be able to organize this session again. So um, have a nice evening or a nice day ahead of you. And thank you very much. And thank you, June, for um, supporting this as <laughs> Give away. Well done, John. Well done, John. And well done, Thank Wasim. you. Thank, Thank you, you all for your patience. So Thank you. <laughs> See you. Okay. Thank you. See you. Bye.